I thought I'd start off with a, with a little bit of uh, context for the talk today. Um, so uh, this is my current mode of transport. Uh, and uh, yesterday, uh, this was what I was doing. Uh, so I'm actually in holiday mode at the moment, which may affect my thinking and my ability to uh, communicate effectively today. So just keep that in mind. Um, I also thought, uh, bearing that in mind, I should uh, uh, provide a few disclaimers as I get started today. Um, first is that despite the title of my talk, this is not a manifesto. Um, I don't know, I'm, a, I'm not all that keen on manifestos generally, it seems a bit sort of pushy or arrogant or something. Um, so why did I say that I was going to give a manifesto? Um, it was really that I wanted, you know, after some recent events, stuff that had been happening recently and things that I've been going to, I wanted to force myself to do a bit of thinking. Uh, and offering to give a talk is a really good way of forcing yourself to do something. Uh, so I've taken that opportunity and started to play around with a few things just at a very early stage, really. Um, uh, you know, I suppose in the end, uh, one man's manifesto is another man's to-do list. So, uh, so that's sort of where I am thinking about that today. My other disclaimer is that I know nothing about infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I haven't had any policy experience. I haven't been on those committees where I've been uh, spreading around the millions of dollars. Um, my experience of infrastructure is, is really as someone who may or may not create it. And it's that may or may not that I really wanted to uh, play around with a bit today and explore. So, now that all of that is perfectly clear, <laughs> We can get started. So, uh, we'll go troving for a bit. So, this story begins about five years ago uh, when I started to get obsessed with this thing called Trove. Uh, this was a long time before I actually started working for Trove. Um, so, it's been a, a long held passion. Does everybody know? Has anybody not heard of Trove before? <laughs> Very helpful for family history. <laughs> Great. I suppose the easiest way to think of Trove is Trove is Australia's digital NZ and papers past sort of combined up together. So it has the, the aggregation functions of digital NZ bringing together the cultural heritage collections. Uh, it also incorporates the digitised newspapers like papers past. And the digitised newspapers are just a phenomenal resource, really changing uh, areas of particularly historical practice, but other areas as well. So whereas now, I think, close to 190 uh, 190 million articles available through Trove, newspaper articles available through Trove. Um, uh, and they're all, you know, fully searchable. They've been OCR'd. People jump in and actually correct the OCR. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's got a living, breathing community around it as well. Uh, and in the context of today's discussion around infrastructure, it's probably also worth noting that Trove, even though it's really now occupies quite a central position in the sort of research infrastructure landscape in Australia, hasn't received a cent of dedicated infrastructure funding. Uh, and this is an interesting <laughs> area uh, about what is classed as infrastructure and where it has to sit. But that's not really what I want to talk about today. Um, so five years ago when I started playing around with Trove, what interested me was starting to go beyond um, the web interface. Starting to think about what happens if we can actually get out all those uh, wonderful newspaper articles in a form that you can manipulate, that you can actually develop scripts around, that you can actually look for patterns and changes within that vast bulk of material. Back then, Trove had no API. No application programming interface, no way of getting out nice, uh, lovely, machine-readable data. There was just the web interface. So what that meant, if I actually wanted to get out stuff that I could work with in this sort of form, I had to screen scrape Trove. I had to create a series of little programs which would actually look for various structures within the HTML pages and write them out in a form that machines could understand. It's a, it's a fairly painful process, uh, writing screen scrapers, because if somebody changes the website, they break. Um, so it's not, not something you want to have to do, but sometimes it is quite useful for getting uh, sort of data which is otherwise inaccessible. 
Um, and in fact, um, so I continued doing this and I got to the point where I actually created my own unofficial API to Trove using my screen scrapers. So I actually put an API up on the Google App Engine, which was just a hosting service for applications, which had all the, uh, the functions of an API. People could go in and build things on top of it, but is actually itself sitting on screen scrapers. Um, I now know, having now working in Trove, that that caused an interesting little <laughs> fuss within the Trove offices when I did this. <laughs> Um, I haven't yet looked up the files about myself uh, in the National Library, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, it was an interesting time. But then they ended up basing various elements of the official API on my unofficial API. So uh, it was, uh, and that was part of the reason why I did it, was to sort of, uh, you know, encourage that discussion around why are APIs useful? What can you do with them? What's the value of getting this data out? So on top of the screen scrapers, I built a whole lot of different types of tools and uh, visualizations. Um, one of the, uh, the main things I built was just a, a harvesting program. So uh, just a little program which you could feed it a search query and it would save all the results into a CSV file. Could also save the full text of all the articles. So it meant that you got that data set that you could then start to explore. Uh, and so I wrote a series of posts which showed how easy it was to do that and then just sort of throw that content into something like Voyant, the, uh, the online uh, text analysis program, uh, and you could start to actually you know, get a picture of what you're actually working with across this, uh, these bodies of sources. And all of this was documented in a series of blog posts. Um, I shared the code itself on GitHub so that anybody could dive in and modify it and use it. And soon people did actually start to use it. Um, uh, there have been a number of people and in fact projects which have been based around using my harvester to get out that content. Uh, and it's a bit embarrassing that some of them are still using my old harvester based on screen scrapers even though there is now an official Trove API. Um, uh, I have to um, tell those people that it's about to uh, totally break and die uh, because there's about to be a totally different inter interface to Trove newspapers and as I said, screen scrapers, changing the HTML, they break. So all of that work from five years ago is about to die in the next <laughs> month or two. So this was interesting, you know, it was interesting starting to think about the possibilities. It wasn't just the code, it was what this made possible, different ways of looking at these sort of data sources. Um, you know, and at the time, uh, sort of back in 2010, um, members of the DH community in Australia and, and New Zealand, we were still just finding each other, really. Um, and uh, in fact, it was in 2010 that um, I organised the first That Camp, the Humanities and Technology, uh, it, which was held in, in Canberra. Uh, and that provided a real opportunity for us to get together and start to see what people were doing and start to think about these sorts of sources and what might be possible. Now, as well as all oh, the scrapers and the harvesters, this started me thinking about different ways I could actually look at that stuff in Trove. Um, different ways of actually visualising the sorts of queries that you might do, into it, do with it. And I um, created a tool or a series of tools called um, Query Pick. Um, it's been through a whole lot of different versions, but the basic principle has always been the same. And that is just, uh, well, you imagine yourself searching Trove, searching the newspapers. You do a search and you get back, uh, you know, 40,000 results, 100,000 results, just in your usual form, results form, just that list of results. It's really hard to know what you've got, you know, when you do that sort of thing. You know, what is this result set? What is it actually telling you? What can you see within it? You can't really see that just from those list of results. So all Query Pick does, and it's really simple, because it was originally just based on screen scrapers again, is just gets the number of matching results per year for your query and displays them. So you can just see how that, that, you know, how that changes over time, how that pattern that you're looking for changes over time. And it, uh, it gives you the ability to also, um, you can see sort of here, you can actually have uh, um, multiple queries, so you can actually compare uh, two different terms. That one's drought and flood in Australia. Um, so you can see how they change against each other over time. Um, 
so it, it's sort of simple, but it's actually one of those things which can be quite powerful in terms of getting a perspective on a large data set. As I said, it's been through various versions. So this was the sort of original version, which was um, just a Python script, uh, and you just uh, ran this script, and it generated an HTML page, which sort of looked like that. Um, eventually, once the Trove, official Trove API became available, I created a new version, which was all HTML and JavaScript-y stuff. So it was actually uh, you know, making live queries to the Trove API and bringing them back and, and displaying them in this form. But you couldn't actually sort of save them. Uh, so finally, I created the current version, uh, which enables you to um, do your queries, but also save them, give them a nice persistent URL. Uh, so it, you basically, it's building up this collection of uh, graphs of visualizations, which you can you know, embed in your own publications or research. So that was a couple of years, well, when was it? 2012, there you go, three years ago now. Um, and people have been using it. Uh, there's, you can browse the ones that people have created and there's, almost 400 of them now that people have created on this site. Um, and, of course, the most important thing, you can search New Zealand as well. Um, so after I'd done this with Trove, I realised that DigitalNZ provides a nice convenient API which, provide, which searches papers past. So it was actually a pretty simple matter to plug that in to the interface. So you can actually search both Australia and New Zealand and indeed, you could compare Australia and New Zealand, if you like, put in a search term at both uh, and see that differences emerge. Um, there are lots of qualifications around all this, and you've got to be conscious of what you're searching and how the search uh, actually is configured and works. Um, but as I said, as a, just a getting, giving yourself a sort of rough picture of what you're working with, it's an interesting way to start, and it can actually raise some interesting questions which you can then go off and pursue. So that's query pick. It's been used. It's even been cited in some published articles. Uh, people have used it. Uh, indeed, just recently, there was an article in uh, Australian Historical Studies, which was largely based around using query pick for a number of searches to look at the history of surfing, in fact. So that's great. Hooray. Wonderful. Except. All the other scholarly works within this publication are cited in the usual way. They have authors. However, query pick doesn't have an author. <laughs> query pick has somehow come into being all of its own uh, for people to use. So this got me thinking. If after all this work, this thinking, this exploration, this building and this sharing, I wasn't actually due the normal recognition that a scholar gets, well, what the fuck have I actually been doing for the past five years? And this sort of, you know, gets the heart of my concerns around the nature of infrastructure and what we're talking about with infrastructure. So uh, earlier this year, I um, attended a couple of workshops uh, about digital infrastructure in the humanities in Australia, which had been organised by the Australian Academy of Humanities. Um, and, you know, it was a pretty depressing experience. Um, I mean, there were lots of positive things that came out of them. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, there was general acceptance, for example, that Trove was a core piece of national infrastructure. So with my Trove hat on, that was great to hear that. Um, it, as I said, you know, even though it hasn't, isn't eligible for the normal types of infrastructure funding, it was good to have that recognition. And, and more generally, you know, the significance of digitization for humanities scholars as infrastructure, digitization as infrastructure was very strongly articulated at that meeting. And I think thought that was really important. Um, and there were also, there are a couple of reviews going on at the moment in Australia around the whole area of infrastructure and we had some reports back from some of those and that's so actually, of course, as a DH person, I got the review and I put it into Voyant 
and made a nice word cloud because that's what you do. Uh, and so one of the and so we had reports back from those reviews, and it was interesting to hear that yes, you know, they certainly were thinking about funding humanities infrastructure alongside the the sciencey stuff. So all that sort of sounded pretty positive, sounded pretty good. So why did I find it depressing? Um, I suppose it's because the assumed way forward uh, for us as a group of humanities scholars was. It was all about framing an argument to government. You know, that was what we had to do in order to go forward with infrastructure is find the right words that we could present to government. We had to determine our top priorities because that's what the government's going to ask. They're going to ask, well, what are your priorities? Um, and we had to develop, of course, a national strategy because that's what we always do. That's where you always start. You have to have a national strategy. And you know, I'm just getting a bit sick of <laughs> this. Getting a bit sick of the whole. Let's develop a new strategy. Um, yeah, and, you know, I understand perfectly the value of that sort of big picture thinking and what that enables you to do. Um, but I also want to do something that exists beyond a sort of nicely formulated strategy document or a new national committee. Um, I want local as well as national um, tactics as well as strategy. So that's sort of where today's title came about. It was that sort of reaction against everything have to be at that top level, that national, the strategy, thinking about what we could do with what we have at that sort of lower level. Um, at one point uh, in these workshops, we were asked to try and describe the state of humanities digital infrastructure in Australia. Uh, and mostly this involved listing uh, the series of large projects uh, within the humanities over the years, uh, ones that had received significant amounts of funding that involved sort of uh, multiple partners, uh, you know, the sorts of projects which are generally favoured by the funding schemes that we have at the moment, which are the large multi-partner, multi-year sort of projects. Um, I put in a word for the work of loan hackers and developers. Um, arguing that there was actually a lot of really valuable infrastructure sitting in the GitHub accounts of individuals. For those of you who don't know what GitHub is, I mean, GitHub is just a code repository, a cloud-based code repository. And a lot of people building stuff in the digital humanities routinely share their code via GitHub. And I find it an incredibly useful resource um, for seeing what people are doing to uh, uh, you know, getting examples of the code so that I can modify it and play with it. Um, you know, I, I always say to people, um, one of my greatest skills, if not my greatest skill as a coder, is the ability to cut and paste. Uh, you know, that borrowing from people is really, and then the sharing and the borrowing is, you know, integral really to the development of the digital humanities for me. So I made this claim about the significance of this, uh, this infrastructure sitting in people's GitHub accounts and you know, people around the room nodded and all that sort of stuff, but uh, didn't really go anywhere. So I was thinking about the discussion more later, um, and it occurred to me that there was this sort of strange sense of um, entitlement and expectation based around the idea that national infrastructure really involved, you know, big machines, this sort of stuff. You know, looking at the science example. Scientists get telescopes, you know? Why can't we have telescopes? You know, where's my telescope? I think I'm going to call this the where's my telescope effect from now on. So where's my telescope? Why can't I have it? And it seemed to be that sort of feeling when we're approaching this question of infrastructure is to look at the sciences, see these big projects, see the money they get, and then think about, well, what's the big project that we have? What's our telescope that we can go to government and ask for money for? Having said that, I do have to admit <laughs> that I have actually talked about Trove as a big telescope uh, in, a, in a chapter I wrote recently um, <coughs> because, uh, you know, I think it's really, I mean, Trove, Trove's newspapers really open up new perspectives on the past. You know, there are those possibilities to start to, to see things differently and those digitised newspapers, Trove and Papers Past, are a site for the creation of new knowledge in the way that a particle accelerator might be, or a telescope. You know, I think there are some arguments to be made there. But 
the, the metaphors, the similes, really only stretch so far. And we've got to be aware of that and think about where the usefulness ends. I mean, if trove is a telescope, then what does that make something like query pick? Um, you know, trove can be used by anyone, anywhere, at any time, um, with an internet connection, of course. It now has an official API, so anybody can start building new applications, new tools, new interfaces, new forms of analysis. So it's not just a thing, it's a platform on which other people can build. People can start to build Trove into their own workflows, their own projects. You know, it's not a standalone thing. And they can then, again, share what they've done, share their hacks, share their code back to the community. So the perception of infrastructure as a series of big machines um, really obscures the emergence of what I think is a, is a bottom-up infrastructure, which is happening now. You know, the tools, the methodologies, the expertise, a network of people, data, and code. And what does that infrastructure look like? Well, it's out there on the web now. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, code, data, and documentation shared on cloud hosting services like GitHub. Uh, you can also use uh, GitHub as this thing called GISTs, which are just ways of sharing quick little hacks or even notes. Uh, people often share them to put drafts or ideas out. You know, there's those sorts of mechanisms. Of course, we have discussions about significance and methodology in blogs. Uh, we have, um, you know, tutorials like those at the Programming Historian, which is a fantastic site um, if you're interested in, in learning about coding within the digital humanities. You can share your data on sites like Figshare or Zenodo. Um, and uh, offline is that uh, wonderful ability to share skills through these emergence of new types of uh, um, uh, groups, you know, things like VAT camps or uh, software carpentry, uh, for example, or other examples of people getting together and sharing skills. Uh, University of Melbourne has a thing called Research Bazaar, which is a sort of festival of, of skill sharing. Uh, so I think there are these really interesting new types of models. So, you know, you have that happening at all different levels. It's happening now, almost no money involved uh, in these sorts of things. Um, people are building this infrastructure now from the ground up. And that's the sort of infrastructure that really gets me excited. Um, not the big machines and the mega dollars, but the people pursuing their passions um, and sharing the results. A community which has the skills and the confidence um, to use, to extend, to tinker, and to create their own tools. Now, you might think that the sorts of things I'm talking about, you know, they're really just research rather than infrastructure. But, um, I mean, taking infrastructure in its broader sense, I mean, it's really just, you know, sets of shared services and systems and resources. So it sort of seems natural to me that um, the more we share our research, our methodologies, our tools, our code, uh, and the, the research outputs, the publications, the more we share, the more blurred these boundaries between research and infrastructure will inevitably become. Um, and that's fine. But <laughs> we've got to have the sort of support mechanisms which are going to uh, en enable people to do that. And that's going to be the challenging thing. Most of the stuff I build um, is around exposing cultural collections in different sorts of ways. Um, and this started way back when I used to work for the National Archives of Australia, in fact. Uh, and I wrote a, a series of what are called user scripts. User scripts are just little bits of JavaScript, little bits of code that sit inside your browser. And when a web page from a particular source loads, the user scripts can be used to totally change the way that that page looks, or even in some cases, functions. So people use it to customize sites. Um, they create these little user scripts and then share them again so other people can apply them and they can see a different version of existing websites. So I use my, uh, my um, user scripts to um, dramatically change the way that digital files within the National Archives of Australia were presented. Uh, and I even added functionality that wasn't available through the Net Archives' own site. 
Uh, so you couldn't, for example, using the archives database, print out a whole file, um, but using my little user script, you could. Um, and I started to play around with other sort of forms of actually starting to visualize the files. This was using a, a now defunct browser plugin called Cool Iris, which enables you to display images on this sort of cool looking 3D wall, which you could just sort of zoom along. And it was a totally different way of looking at these files. Um, you know, there was nothing, no way of looking at uh, this sort of stuff within the, the uh, archive zone systems. Um, uh, this, uh, I suppose, perhaps is obvious, perhaps not, was also unofficial. So even though I was working at the archives at the time, I was sort of fiddling around in, in my own time and doing this sort of stuff. Uh, and it did cause a couple of dramas here and there. Um, after I left the archives, I continued to play around uh, with cultural collections, uh, the archives in the library. Um, I don't know. I'll, so these are some of the projects that I've worked on over the years, which you can get at through my website if you want to have a play around with any of them. Um, the best known would be this, uh, which is the real face of white Australia. Um, if you haven't seen it before, um, what I did was I downloaded about 12,000 uh, images from the National Archives, uh, which were certificates used in the administration of the White Australia policy. Um, I then ran a facial detection script over those images, um, uh, extracted the portraits, and they're amazing looking certificates. They have portrait uh, on the, the front of them, on the back of them they have these black handprints. They're really, really compelling. Uh, and my partner, Kate Bagnall, and I have been working for a long time on ways of exposing these records um, and uh, new ways of using them. So, um, again, this is all online. You can, you can have a look at it. Um, from there, I mean, this, is, this project has led to all sorts of other things. Um, one little thing, a uh, little hack, which I quite liked, was um, I took... Having taken those faces from Record Search, which is the National Archives database, and exposing them in that sort of different way, I thought, well, why don't I go the other way and put the faces back into Record Search? So I created again another little user script, thing that runs in your browser, so that when it loads a page of search results in uh, Record Search, that's what they normally look like um, with these little icons. Um, my user script goes off and searches my database, finds a person within that file and, and at random and shows you their image instead of that little icon. So instead of just seeing the files, you see that there are indeed people inside. Um, all sorts of other stuff. I mean, uh, things like uh, this little game I created called Headline Roulette using Trove, where you have to guess the date of a random newspaper article. It sounds really dumb, but people really like it. <laughs> uh, and soon after I actually created it, I had somebody emailing me asking if there was a way to store her scores. Uh, so um, you never know what's going to take the fancy, but it's actually a way, uh, you can actually find your way through there back into the trove. So it's sort of, you know, in some ways a discovery interface, also just a really silly game. Uh, this was another sort of playful thing, uh, Future of the Past, again, pulling stuff from Trove, uh, uh, um, sorting by um, a certain statistical value within those articles. I won't go into it, but um, it was just another sort of, and you might see the uh, influence of the sort of uh, fridge poetry thing. <laughs> um, and that was sort of the idea around it. I just, I, rather than sort of focus on uh, sort of text as blocks. I just sort of got really interested in the words themselves and playing around with the words and seeing what you could do. Again, you can go from this, you can just you drill you down, you can find newspaper articles, but that's sort of not the point. It's just sort of uh, uh, immersing yourself in, in this language in a way. Um, and it gives you the possibility to actually create your own poetry. So you just drag words from there, you drop them into the box down there, you can move them around, and when you're happy, you click on the tweet button and you share your poem with the world. Uh, and this, <laughs> this, this won the uh, uh, award <laughs> in the, the Digital Humanities Awards, the inaugural Digital Humanities Awards, uh, won, to, won the uh, best use of DH for fun. 
Um, uh, I make Twitter bots. Uh, I think it's really interesting to explore the way we can mobilize our cultural collections within the spaces where people already are, rather than assuming that they're going to come to you. So looking at the possibilities within social media. Um, so Trove Newsbot, there's quite a few collection bots around. Um, I think Trove Newsbot was the first, if not nearly the first. Um, he does all sorts of stuff as well as just sharing random newspaper articles throughout the day. He responds to queries. So if you tweet at him, he will take your tweet, the words in your tweet, and he will search for them within Trove newspapers, and he will tweet you back the most relevant result. Um, so you can actually search Trove from Twitter. Um, he does other stuff as well. He responds to other news sources. So in this case, he goes off to the Australian Broadcasting Commission news site, um, finds the latest headline, uh, extracts keywords from that page, and then searches for those within his historical collection. So he actually creates this dialogue between past and present uh, using the current headlines and the ones that he finds within his historical newspaper collection. Um, there's all sorts of other stuff which he does as well, and there's another bot called Trovebot which does uh, the same thing for the rest of Trove. So Trove Newsbot uh, uses the newspapers, Trovebot uh, does all the other stuff that's within Trove. Um, I've continued to play around with face stuff. Um, and I talked, uh, this got a mention at NDF, if those of you were at NDF last week, um, where I started playing around with the eyes and faces. Um, uh, this is called Eyes on the Past. The, the eyes blink on and off. Uh, and if you click on them, then the face opens. Uh, and you can click on the caption and you can actually find where that person is within Trove newspapers. Um, a little project which was playing around with data from, which is in Trove, from the uh, Australian Broadcasting Commission, their current affairs program. So we've got summaries of uh, uh, 200,000 radio programs in Trove including all the current affairs programs at individual segment level from the late 1990s. So it's a really rich resource for thinking about exploring uh, um, current affairs, uh, political, cultural history. So just as a very quick example, I just uh, extracted a single word per month for each of those programs using a, a statistical value called TFIDF. Um, Again, it was just a, a quick, playful thing done in a day or so just to give people an idea of what becomes possible once we start to get this data in digital form. Um, most recently, there's this thing, the Vintage Face Depot, which is another Twitter bot, uh, which takes my growing collection of faces which I've been extracting from newspapers. I've got about 6,000 faces that I've extracted from Trove newspapers. Um, and you tweet a picture of yourself to it, and it tweets you back a new version of yourself which has one of the historical faces overlaid with your face. Um, again, I talked about all this face stuff a bit more at NDF last week and if you go to my blog you can see that talk and the video is even now online because um, there's a sort of theme within the, the facial stuff that I've been working through. Um, but, uh, oh, and most recently this thing which was working with uh, files within the National Archives which are, have been classified as closed on national security grounds. You can get the file titles. Well, in most cases you can get the file titles. Um, so I harvested all the file titles out of the closed files to play around with in different ways. Um, and one night, and again it literally was one night. I mean that's the thing I like to emphasise with a lot of this playing around. Real Face of White Australia was built effectively over a weekend. Um, the eyes on the past. I started extracting eyes on a Friday night and I pushed the first version live on a Sunday night. So once you, you know, become familiar with the tools, it's actually quite quick to actually do these sorts of experiments and explorations. Um, so this, I um, was playing around with a Markov chain generator, which is just a sort of way of creating random text strings from a body of text. It's sort of create stuff which is in the style of the original text, but is effectively nonsense. Um, and um, I started doing this with the contents of these file titles. And I thought, you know, I'd create all these silly file titles, which I could tweet out, you know, as you do. Uh, but when I started doing it and generating the, uh, the file titles, I found they were almost indistinguishable from the real file titles. <laughs> Um, which said something about the language of national security, I think. 
So I decided to make it into a little game where you had to guess which was the real file title and which was the, the, uh, the randomly generated one. So you can go online and you can test, you know, whether you're, you've got the ability to uh, protect Australia or New Zealand or anybody else. So, um, you know, it's all a very diverse bunch of stuff. Um, I like to think that what they do is they, they allow us to see the collections differently in some way. Um, um, and more importantly, I suppose, to think differently about the sorts of connections that we make with the past. Um, and that was really the theme of the, the talk that I gave at the Digital Humanities Conference earlier this year, that how we negotiate that relationship with the past. But of course, I'm not the only one tinkering with cultural heritage collections. Um, if, if those of you who were at NDF um, would have seen George Oates uh, talk about a number of her projects, playing around with the uh, Victorian Albert Museum and the, uh, the Wellcome Institute and various other institutions. Um, I work at the University of Canberra with Mitchell Whitelaw, uh, who's uh, developed a number of uh, alternative interfaces. In fact, he, he coined the phrase generous interfaces to describe what it is that he does here in, at, well, at NDF um, in 2011. Um, and he's recently just published an article about an individual humanities quarterly, which, which talks about the whole idea of generous interfaces and, and what they mean, uh, contrasting them with the sort of typical search box on the, your web page. So in recent weeks, we've been sort of pondering on Twitter, forming some sort of um, league of noodlers, uh, people who, who play around with, with cultural heritage data in different ways and create these sort of unsolicited interfaces. Um, and it would be you know, interesting to sort of bring together what it is that we do in some ways and think about what it is that we do. I mean, to recognise this form of, of noodling, experimentation, whatever you want to call it, as significant and creative work. Um, and as work which does you know, blur that line between research and infrastructure. I mean, we're creating tools, we're creating interfaces which can be used but we're also uh, uh, you know, questioning what it is that we're doing in terms of these uh, mechanisms for discovery. So I wasn't intending to rehearse the whole um, building is research argument here today. Uh, you know, I think um, oh, we've now got plenty of great examples of people um, articulating and developing uh, projects around the sort of critical making idea, um, Gentry says. Uh, of course, and Bill Turkell, um, other people, um, you know, Bethany Yavisky, Miriam Posner, Jean Bauer, and many others have, you know, drawn attention really to the, the, all the thinking um, that underpins our work with code and data. Um, I mean, I suppose it's true to say that my experience with query pick and uh, being authorless uh, indicates that we have a way to go in sort of making those arguments outside of the, the digital humanities community. But, you know, um, one battle at a time. Um, so noodling, creating stuff, playing with this cultural data is fun. It's illuminating, it's challenging. Um, but as I was sitting in George Oates's keynote uh, last week, I was started thinking about, you know, noodling versus needling, interfaces versus interventions infrastructure versus infrapuncture. And I have to admit that I stole infrapuncture from Deb Verhoeven, uh, who's also you know, thinking about different infrastructure models. I think that's a great word. Um, I mean, why do we bother creating these sorts of alternative cultural interfaces? What's the point of it? Uh, you know, they're not intended to be a replacement as such for traditional discovery services. Nobody's gonna go to my eyes in order to find newspapers. Uh, you know, it's, it's a different point. Um, but I think, you know, there are great opportunities for creating interfaces that are actually less comfortable and less familiar uh, and less predictable that do actually have a point rather than just provide a service to get us to think differently. And certainly, you know, there's a, there's a sort of political edge running through a lot of what I do, most obvious in the White Australia work, of course, uh, but more generally around that question of access and what access is. Um, uh, recently, in fact, I, I 
gotten interested in tracing some of the threads of surveillance, state surveillance, from the wide Australia policy through to the development of intelligence services in Australia and through, of course, to the current day where we've, uh, you know, taken as routine to have the sort of levels of uh, electronic surveillance that we would not have um, accepted before. So in order to start to think about this, what did I do? Well, of course, I fired up another one of my screen scrapers the one that extracts stuff from the National Archives database. And I downloaded a whole lot of files. Um, these are all the files from the Australian Secret Intelligence Organisation, that are a security intelligence organisation, which are publicly available through the National Archives. Uh, and that has, as you see, has included almost 300,000 page images, uh, representing about 12,000 files. Now, part of the reason I want to do this is that that whole process around access to these files, the ASIO files, Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, is in itself quite mysterious. Unlike other government agencies, the security agencies don't really have to tell you upfront what they have. Other government agencies, you know, as part of the normal process uh, of uh, material moving into the archives, uh, you know, you, you get lists of the files and they come through and you can... Uh, uh, search those. ASIO doesn't do that. If you want to get ASIO files, you have to go on this sort of phishing expedition where you ask, have you got a file on Tim Sherritt? And they get back to you and they either say, oh no, sorry, we don't have a file on Tim Sherritt. Or they say, oh yes, congratulations, we do have a file on you. And, and then you have to go through various other procedures where it has to, the content of the file has to be examined to make sure that there's you know, no, nothing which is going to embarrass other governments or there's nothing which is going to expose the way that the security agencies do their work, all those sorts of things. But this whole idea that you know, there's this dark archive which you, we can't get access to, all we can do is just ask questions of it to get things back, uh, is really... Um, interesting and compelling and, and you know I think we need to start exploring um, that some more. So I had an idea that, and this is still just an idea at this stage, um, that if we could get what is publicly available now it might be possible to sort of read back in some way from what's, what's available back to this dark archive to sort of see patterns and structures within the publicly available version which could enable you to make some uh, assumptions about what's sort of going on. Similarly, I've you know, long wanted to actually do some more work on the White Australia records, which are actually using the records as, as a way of trying to reconstruct the bureaucracy and how it operated within um, the Australian context. Um, but, um, you know, to keep all this to myself would really just be, you know, continuing to perpetuate all those mysteries around access and how you get stuff. If I just had that sitting on my hard drive and fiddled away with it, Sort of not getting that far. So I have made, um, so all the, the metadata that I've harvested is now up on GitHub. Anybody can go and access it. All the code that I used to get that files is also there. Uh, there's, oops, there's, and there it is. Um, so there's, uh, there's summaries of the, the metadata. You can just download the CSV files for each, fi for each series. Uh, in terms of the images, there's around 70 gigabytes of those. Uh, I'm happy to share those with anybody who asks me. I haven't put it online because it just seems a bit uh, impractical at the moment. But uh, I can actually, I've, I've set it up so that it can be torrented if somebody uh, wants a, a, access to it. So it's all there. And I usually carry around them on a USB stick too. Uh, so if anybody wants a copy, I can just give it to them. Because that's part of the point. You know, it's actually taking this stuff which was secret, which is now semi-locked away within this database, which is hard to access and pull data out of, get it out in a form which can be reused, and then to share it. Um, a few months ago, uh, Alex uh, Giller, um, digital humanities researcher uh, and wonderful guy, um, wrote a post about Gorilla DH about engaging with the, the politics of interfaces and access uh, in new sorts of ways. And he's got a wonderful quote where he talks about building playgrounds on the margins of the law. Um, and it just sounds like a pretty, pretty good model for infrastructure, I reckon. <laughs> um, 
about using the technologies that we have to explore new ways of, of opening up access to the archives. Um, so, and I sort of think that as well as the infrastructure of, of the middle, um, the infrastructure of the safe and the solid, um, we also need an infrastructure of the edges. Um, noodling that takes us to difficult and uncomfortable places and interfaces that intervene to upset our expectations. Um, you may have seen just recently the American Historical Association approved guidelines for the evaluation of digital projects and they've got a committee, a working group, which is continuing to work on this. And it's obviously important if we talk about this sort of stuff, if we talk about the role of people in creating and sharing these sorts of things, to build mechanisms to support them. Uh, and they operate in all sorts of different ways, um, you know, from uh, questions of careers and uh, professional rewards. Uh, and, ha and, that ne and in order to do that, we need to have these systems which uh, encourage people to think about how digital projects can be assessed and understood alongside other sorts of research and other sorts of uh, academic work. Um, and just yesterday, um, DH Commons was launched, which provides a platform for the review of projects. So projects can be peer reviewed uh, in the same way as a research article can be. Um, so that provides another really important mechanism for getting this sort of digital work uh, at a point where it can be recognised and you can get the sort of uh, academic rewards for it. And there's a whole lot of scope for using uh, the sort of tools that we have available now uh, in, in better ways which actually uh, make clear our uh, research contributions. Um, and, you know, there are opportunities for us just to, to, uh, to share more information about best practice and the way you can go about it. And my example here is that I spent a day just recently uh, f trying to figure out the best way of uh, preserving a blog post and creating a DOI for that blog post. Because, you know, a lot of my stuff goes on my blog. I want a way that that uh, can be represented within the normal markers of, uh, of academia, which are things like DOIs. Um, and it was possible, but you know, it wasn't as straightforward as, as I thought it might be. Um, and I ended up going a bit overboard. Uh, so I ended up, uh, I created a PDF of my blog post. It all seems a bit silly, but you know, this is what you're going to do. Created a PDF of my blog post, uploaded it to Figshare, which is the data sharing site, but you can also upload articles there. If you upload to Figshare, you get a DOI. Uh, it's also preserved. They, they um, are connected to Clocks, which is the, one of the digital preservation projects. Um, so that was cool, uh, but just for good measure, I also submitted the URL to the Internet Archive, to the Wayback Machine. And if you go to the Wayback Machine, there's a little box down there where you can just put in a URL and it immediately creates an archive copy of that page. Uh, so you can just, it's really useful just for anything that you're using on the web, you know, any page that you want to refer to later. Before you, you know, cite it in your paper, make sure you drop it in there and get an archive copy within the Internet Archive. So I could do that for my article, create a nice archive version of the Internet Archive. Uh, I also, just for good measure, uh, set up a, 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 a plugin, a WordPress plugin, which connects with your GitHub account and saves all the content of your blog into GitHub with all the versions that you might create of your blog posts. It's really cool, actually, because you can actually just edit your posts on GitHub and it will push it to your WordPress file, so it can go both ways. Um, but it means I now have this sort of complete archive of my blog sitting on my GitHub site as well. As I said, went a bit overboard, but anyway, you know, what's the, you know, lots of copies keep stuff safe. Um, and then, of course, I had to put all the, the URLs that I now had for my stuff into my blog post. Uh, so my single blog post now has the, the normal blog uh, uh, URL, has its DOI, it has its Internet Archive version, it has, has its GitHub version. So I think I covered all my bases. Um, you know, as I said, it wasn't hard, but it should have been much easier. Uh, and I now need to write this process up so that if there's anything useful here, somebody else can learn from it. Um, it's also made me think that there should just be a, a WordPress plugin which makes all this stuff really easy. Um, 
So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are all sorts of other stuff we can be doing too, particularly around publication itself. Um, and I've got another little project um, which I'm working on, which is looking at creating um, uh, a framework for publishing historical narrative, which is uh, enriched by linked open data. Um, I don't really have time to give the demo today, but I, if you want to have a play around, it's live online. Um, what it means is that it takes, uh, you know, your research work, um, and if you're a historian, um, you know, you're creating um, a data set, effectively, of, you know, you'll have a little data set of people, places, events, all that sort of stuff, which sort of gets squashed out of your narrative when you come to write it up, you know, to produce that thing which is going to end up as a PDF. Um, and I think we need to develop these mechanisms. I mean, you know, and there are some good models out there now. Um, uh, Scalar, for example, is a platform for publishing sort of rich, uh, different types of uh, narratives. Um, but we need those sort of things as well, so that we're not pretending that that PDF, that publication, is something totally separate to all the digital stuff. You know, they are bound together. And we need the sort of publication forms which demonstrate how uh, close and uh, rich that binding is. Um, but of course, if we're concerned with infrastructure as a network of people, of practice and technology, then we need to consider that really basic level of support, you know, for people. Um, and not just the people who currently work in academia. I mean, all of what I've said should really apply to people who work within cultural heritage organisations as well. Um, and in some ways their task is harder because uh, they often lack you know, some of the basic freedoms around the sort of idea of research. Um, you know, despite all the wonderful rec rhetoric we have around innovation, creating new things is really hard and really painful and it takes a personal toll. Um, and we're all familiar with that standard advice you give to people who are thinking of doing this sort of stuff. Uh, and it is, um, you know, seek forgiveness rather than permission, right? But that's not good enough because it often comes at a personal cost. You know, you can't just keep doing that all the time. It takes its toll on you. People give up, people burn out, people just go quiet. You know, people who are really active and doing stuff, it just gets too much. So we've got to find ways to support those people in all those sorts of different contexts. Um, so I want an infrastructure that provides that sort of personal encouragement um, as well as the sort of more professional acknowledgement and recognition. Schemes that are both formal and informal that really address the human costs as well as the technological ones. Um, and it's not just skills development. Uh, you know, when it comes to infrastructure, obviously when it talks about people, we talk about giving them the skills to use the infrastructure, and that's not enough. Um, it's, it's providing this basic sustenance, um, both in terms of you know, your bank balance and your soul. Um, it's about creating room for, for, for comfort, for collegiality, um, and for fun. And you know, it's great to see um, things like uh, Chris McDowell in Auckland uh, has been involved in creating a data poet society. Um, in Melbourne, there's a group who call themselves the Digital Fabulists, which are digital humanities people, but it's creating these sorts of uh, um, opportunities for sharing information, for collaborating on projects, but in a fun, in a collegial, in a supportive sort of environment. So it's not training, it's just sharing, it's just playing, it's just thinking, it's just following your passions and sharing them with others. Um, and I think it's a really great sort of model. And I wanted to end back with Alex uh, and his article about Gorilla DH, because he's got a wonderful quote. Do it if you can, if the spirit moves you, and where you will be most useful. Wouldn't want a revolution without dancing. Uh, and really, you know, that's my kind of infrastructure. Uh, and I think probably a pretty good basis for a manifesto as well. Um, so thanks. Tim, that was inspiring as usual. Um, all of Tim's talks are like this, by the way. Um, I'm really glad they don't, that they don't always have llamas, however. They don't always have llamas. <laughs> um, I'm really glad that Tim's here because to me, he evokes the spirit of digital humanities. It's what um, 
I want digital humanities to be, and it's why I want us to do more teaching in digital humanities. I think he's a great example of what happens if you teach arts and humanities students how to code. Um, lots of unexpected things fall out, and we should be um, promoting more of that. So we've sort of um, we've used our hour, but no one's chucking this out, and there's probably some questions. So if anyone's got questions, um, ask away, and I'll let him, him choose. Yeah, Ellen. It's fantastic history of work, by the way. It's really uh, marvelous to uh, see you in person <laughs> see that history uh, there. It's really remarkable. I had a question, uh, which is, uh, so GitHub went um, to Rackspace in, I think, 2009. So they outsourced their uh, infrastructure to a managed uh, cloud company. So I'm wondering, what is the, uh, what is, what is your thinking about the proper relationship between what you call local and tactical informal projects on the one hand, and this uh, wrestle giant mm -hmm. infrastructural cloud companies in the background? Uh, is it not the case that in order to be dancing ourselves, we need to take advantage of these platforms? These stages are not being built by Amazon's cloud, Google's cloud, Microsoft's cloud, uh, Rackspace, uh, etc. The only exception right now, I think, is that the Internet Archive you mentioned is still running their own servers on, on petaboxes, they, they call them. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and I think that's part of our responsibility uh, as digital humanists to be, you know, being prepared to be critical of the tools that we're always using. Um, and. Um, so on the, yeah, but I mean, on the one hand, we can take advantage of these sorts of things, I think, at least at the moment. I mean, we've got to keep you know, thinking about that sort of relationship of what it means, what we're committing, it, what we're committing to, what um, uh, you know, are the politics of the organisations uh, that we're taking advantage of in using these sorts of things. I mean, it was uh, last week at NDF, I gave a talk around facial recognition um, uh, and it was sort of posing a similar sort of question in a way in that, you know, there are now these tools which, uh, you know, enable you both to detect and recognise faces across large data sets. And within a cultural heritage setting, you could see how that could be really, really useful, uh, working with a large image collection to be able to find the people and do all that sort of stuff. But then, of course, um, the reason why there have been these advantage, advances in that technology uh, first of all, because of the commercial imperative with Facebook uh, wanting to know who you are, not only you know, being able to tag you in photos, be able to market to you directly because they know that you're male or of a certain age or you know, all that sort of thing which they can increasingly start to read from these photos. But also, of course, the surveillance uh, uses of these technologies. So what do we do? Um, do we uh, you know, avoid uh, buying into these sorts of technologies at all? Do we use them and use them sort of reflexively to be their own critique in a way? Or to, as I sort of, I gave a few examples in my NDF talk about actually sort of fucking around with the technologies themselves by <laughs> the one guy who, who uses Google's Deep Dream uh, to create new versions of himself and then feeds them to Facebook uh, to be tagged by Facebook as versions of himself to really sort of <laughs> mess with the with the uh, the neural networks. Um, so there's sort of interesting possibilities there. So I don't know if that's a very good answer to your question, but I, d I do think that um, we yeah I mean that should be part of our job uh, as digital humanists is being critical of the tools that we use all the time. Yeah, I think as well, arguing for open data, making sure that your data is portable, so that yep. if, you, if you put it into one of these into one of these corporate data data sets, you can take it out again and transfer it to a new service if if you so desire. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got a question. Um, I, I agree with you know you you um, arguing for local and tactical. Um, but as a New Zealander, it's easy for me to say, well. Yeah, it's easy for an Aussie to say that, because you actually have national strategy <laughs> around infrastructure. And I think we've suffered from a lack of national strategy and policy in New Zealand, um, especially um, the humanities, because we haven't had a voice and things have, have really slewed towards STEM just at a point when digital humanities needs some incentive to get off the ground. Mm. Um, so not just around um, government level policy or national level policy around infrastructure development, like 
you know, missions, but also incentives for um, academics to start building digital projects and have them assessed as part of their their um, their output. So, I guess my question is how how do you balance local and tactical with strategic, or can? You? Yeah, that's the big question, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, I yeah, of course. I mean, you you do have to um, be able to make those arguments to government as well, you know, because you, you don't want to be sort of totally left out and ignored. But you know, there is that possibility. Even while you're framing those arguments, there's the possibility again to be um, be prepared as humanists to be questioning what we actually mean by infrastructure all the time. You know, I, I suppose, you know, it's that playing that game of being able to frame the argument that you need for a particular point, but try also trying to evolve the understanding of what it is that we're doing and working with. And particularly, I don't know, it's really hard because, I mean, I can understand that, you know, we want our own, I want my own telescope sort of thing. I mean, you, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be left out, but um, it doesn't seem uh, like in terms of the, the work that humanities researchers do, it seems to be sort of heading down the wrong path in some way to try and think of ourselves as akin to science, that we need the same sort of... And, you know, and that's, these discussions I was at, it was all about, well, you know, um, we're going to have this power to visualise huge amounts of humanities data, you know, seeing that that was the, the sort of end goal. Um, and, you know... I'll, a lot of what we're interested in is the relationship between small and large and that sort of shifting of scales and being able to sort of find those stories uh, and negotiate this broader context as well. And it's a different sort of thing. Um, it's not, you know, a particle accelerator. Yeah, it's I, that. I think we, uh, the humanities understanding of infrastructure is, is skewed. We, either, we deny the fact that we've got any infrastructure at all when actually our infrastructure is the internet. It's massive. Mm. Um, and, it, and it moves out into the cultural tundra. And I think that you, you really, your, your work reflects that. That, um, that when, when humanists really start using our infrastructure, it will be around the edges. It won't be using telescopes so much. Mm. 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 I'm kind of related to that. Um, thank you for that, by the way. I think you really opened my mind to like the meaning of infrastructure. It's not sort of what I was imagining at all. Um, but I'm sort of wondering what your thoughts are on because um, you've been talking a bit about dark archives and sort of doing things, you know, on the edge of the law and, and all that kind of stuff and um, making available what's usually hidden um, by government security bureaus and all that kind of stuff. How much how much power do you think? digital humanists actually have and do you think there's this kind of, because the way I see it is this sort of um, constant play between you know the, the people at the top and um, people like you who are sort of just playing around and, and trying to um, yeah test different things and, and make things less comfortable and, and bring things out of the open. Um, do you think that people like you are sort of usually one step ahead of, of the people who are sort of catching up? Like, do you think, because you've said that people are getting worried about what, what you're doing, and has it actually even stopped you? Or, like, I'm sort of just interested in this. Yeah. Um, oh, look, I mean, you know, I mean, what I do, it's not, it's not, it's not like um, you know, ASIO is going to be concerned. Well, they might. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it's um, the... You know, there are people doing important, risky stuff out there. Uh, you know, the whistleblowers of the world. And just recently we had, the, uh, you know, all that, uh, those documents revealed around drone strikes, for example, via whistleblowers. And um, that's, uh, you know, I, it's not what I do. Um, I'm not that brave. Um, uh, what I do uh, is to really try and just, I mean, part of the battle is just people understanding that, there's, um, even in the way that we understand what is secret, for example, um, what gets classified as secret, how it gets, uh, have a certain status within uh, government. There's a bureaucratic process, is there? There's nothing magical, there's nothing mysterious, you know, it's just this sort of, 
uh, you know, levels which, which things go through and somebody decides that it's a secret and it gets put in a red folder or whatever, you know, they used to do that. Um, so I think there's, part of what I'm interested in is just um, really making people aware that there's nothing magical in these processes and they can intervene and they, uh, you know, the, you're not going to get ASIO knocking down your door by pulling a whole lot of stuff out of the National Archives. But by doing so, you can enable different types of research. You can enable different ways of looking at this material. You can actually start to develop critiques around how our whole idea of national security by looking at what the files that have been withheld on those grounds are. So you can develop these sorts of, you know, range of critiques by these sorts of um, things. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, there are, okay, I mean, there are, by making a lot of the stuff that I, that I like the ASIO files or whatever, over the, the, even the White Australia stuff, which I put out there, I don't know what the copyright status of a lot of that is. Uh, and it's sort of almost impossible to tell with some of it. Um, so there's that risk that somebody could object, uh, but that's more likely that uh, it would just be a way of, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's, um, so there are those sorts of risks and that's the sort of you know, space where we can start to do stuff at least because it's all in that space is always risk management. Uh, you know, it, even just with Trove's newspapers. We go up mostly to 1954, but there's no guarantee that everything pre-1954 is out of copyright. There will be copyright stuff there, and all cultural institutions work on a risk management process. And even just building awareness of that in terms of the stupidity of our copyright laws um, and the fact that, you know, archival material is perpetually in copyright in Australia. Um, so there's a whole range of questions about the way we access stuff and we use things, which are, um, you know, around both our understandings and expectations and also the uh, legislation and practice. Um, and it's all sort of folded in on each other and can be really hard to sort of spread out and understand. And so I suppose that's where I position myself as trying to to, um, you know, spread out those things so that people can actually sort of see how things connect up a bit uh, and uh, uh, therefore be able to have a more um, informed position when it comes to, uh, you know, things like national security and secrecy and surveillance. It's close to that, that, that you're articulating a, a core sort of practice traditional practice of humanities and social science, which is a critique and an exploration of power. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just, you know, code enables that, yeah. because in post-industrial society, post-industrial society is enabled by information and code and, and IT infrastructure. Mm, so absolutely. it just speaks quite strongly to where we need to be to position ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, um, thank Tom very much. And um...